Isabel Grock, welcome to the Conservation Canine Podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Well, it's great to be here, James. Thank you for, for having me today. No, no, no. I've been trying to get you. We've obviously been trying to get a, a time in the in the calendar for a little while. And, uh, you know, what with COVID and everything, it's been a bit difficult, hasn't it? How are you, uh, how are you feeling now? You, you, you had a, a reaction to your um, immunization, didn't you, or your booster? I did. Actually, this is why I know we've been trying to, to connect for a long time. And I was even trying to get to manage a trip to a Australia to, to do more research for, for the book on conservation canines and COVID always seems to get in the way no matter what. So recently I did get my booster and then got sick. So can you believe it? Yeah, <laughs> But nice, I'm nice, here nice, now. Cool. Yeah, which is great. Um, so for those who haven't heard of you or aren't aware of your work yet, let's, let's just start by talking a little bit about who you are, what you do, um, yeah, by way of introduction. Of course, yes, uh, James. So I'm. Um, my name is Isabel. I'm a. I'm a writer, a photographer, a filmmaker, book author, and I focus on wildlife conservation, endangered species, and uh, the relationships between people and the natural world. Um, I, as you can tell from the accent, I grew up in France, but I've lived in Vancouver, Canada, for the last oh, uh, twenty-five years at least. You weren't tempted to go to the French-speaking side of Canada? <laughs> uh, no, you know what? But because, first of all, the uh, accent there from uh, people in Quebec is very different from uh, the French we speak in France. So I was too embarrassed to admit that I would probably not understand what they're talking about. So I avoided that. And also there's the climate. Uh, I grew up in the southwest of France, which tends to be warm even though now it's getting too warm with a with a changing climate in the summer it's uh it's hardly bearable but i didn't feel like wanting to face the the cold uh, winters in in montreal so i i just came to live in um, in vancouver where i had never been before but it looked like fantastic place with uh, ocean mountain and um, yeah so i just uh, came to uh, to take that adventure and uh, I haven't never left since so it's it's home now <laughs> great so let's kind of take you back to the beginning then so so how did you end up in this kind of line of work what, what drove you through to doing what you do now yeah, it's a great question James it's it's actually started when I was a uh, a child I I grew I was growing up in France in um in a town in the southwest, uh, a small town, really far from uh, from the ocean, uh, near Toulouse, and I so remember distinctly. I was with uh, with my parents uh, one evening. We were watching television. I must have been nine or ten years old, and there had just been um, a massive oil spill in in France that affected the the coast of uh, Brittany. And I saw those images and I saw the, the images of the seabirds covered in oil. And I was I stopped what I was doing and I was completely glued to the to the screen. And I remember uh, people, uh, they were pretty desperate there in, in Brittany and they were asking for help. They said, we, we need help, volunteers to help us clean up the, the shorelines and clean up the, the birds. And I said to my parents right away, I want to go, I want to go there and, and help um, save the birds. And, you know, my parents, I can imagine their reaction. They said, ah, no, you're not going, you're going to stay in school. And I said, okay, well, I was pretty disappointed. But for me, it was a turning point in the sense that I realized that, um, you know, it was the, those images that I saw on television that made me uh, want to take action. And remember where I grew up in uh, this uh, town near Toulouse, uh, no ocean. So I've never been, I've never been to the ocean, never seen the ocean, never been to Brittany. I've never seen a seabird in my entire life. So I had really no personal uh, connection to, to that environment. And yet it was enough for me just seeing what had was happening there and the environmental devastation. Uh, it devastated me and I wanted to, to take action. So I became curious about the people that actually produce those images. And then I realized that after doing a little bit of research that there are people called uh, journalists, photojournalists, photographers, 
And I said to myself, this is what I want to do. When I grow up, I want to be a, a photojournalist and I want to write and document uh, environmental issues so that we can better protect the natural world. So I, I kept that promise. I graduated from high school. I went to university in Paris, a big city. And then after that, I went to New York where I did um, uh, a degree, a master's degree in, in journalism. I specialize in photojournalism. And after I graduated, did a number of things and then ended up in uh, Vancouver where I, I started doing this, so following scientists in the field, conservationists uh, all over the world, really, to, to document different species and what people were, were doing to learn about species uh, and wildlife at risk and, uh, and how to protect them and just telling those uh, those stories really so that's that's how i got started <laughs> it's, it's just fascinating there's there's so many questions i could go into on that but what i thought we'd start with because obviously we've got quite a lot to talk about in the conservation you know canine world but before we get into that i thought it'd be nice to talk about your new documentary that's just been released which i i haven't managed to see yet i'm desperately trying to work out how i can watch that in this part of the world but, <laughs> uh, so maybe you can touch on that as well but uh we'd like to talk about what the documentary is and and just tell us about how that came about and what the challenges and successes were with making that oh for sure james yes it's a uh, yes that i'm really excited because this documentary is just now being released it's going through uh, film festivals now and it's uh, always so so special to finally bring that story to audiences because documentaries takes such a long time to make. It's been uh, four years in the making and uh, through COVID, it started before COVID. And so I'm, I'm really so excited now to to get you uh, to bring that to audiences and and watch people's reactions as they as they see the film, discover it, and and particularly the Q and A's after the screenings, uh, interacting with people who've just watched the films, and and then the debates and the, the interactions. It's just absolutely. Um, magical to, to be able to finally do that. So how it came about is, um, so I've always been in my career, I could never decide, some people decide, okay, they're going to be writers, others decide that they're going to be photographers, others decide to be filmmakers. I really wanted to do it all. I could never choose. So for me, telling stories is about combining words and, and images and films as well. So I've always played with, with all these different ways of, uh, of telling stories. And one of the things I've been really passionate about is the relationships between people and, and wildlife and how we, we interact with the wild. And this film came about, uh, it's about wolves and it's called Part of the Pack. And it's about the relationship between people and wolves. And in, in Canada, where I live in, in British Columbia, people have a bit of a love-hate relationship with, with wolves. Um, they've been uh, persecuted and, um, and hunted and tracked down and eliminated. And the wolves have tried many times to make a comeback to, to BC. And now uh, they have come back and they're, they're coming back on Vancouver Island, for example, in British Columbia, in spaces that are not like um, the spaces or landscape that were like 200 years ago. Uh, there are a lot of more people on the landscape now. So that means that those wolves, while they're more accepted by people, they have to navigate spaces where uh, people want to be as well. So uh, habitat, natural habitats are shrinking. So that leads invariably to more encounters between people and wolves and wildlife. And, and the film is about how we navigate those relationships and how we, we interact with the wild, trying to preserve spaces uh, for wildlife to, to navigate and, uh, and do what, what they need to do. And um, in this film, I wanted to explore uh, the whole spectrum of uh, the fascination that people have for for wolves. So we I, I, we follow three different stories and three different characters. One of them is is a woman who had heard of um, who lived in Victoria and Vancouver Island, and she's heard of this lone wolf on this little island. And so she went out and studied the wolf just to because she was so curious about it. And um, and so she developed that relationship with this wolf. And then eventually the wolf got off the island and went into different areas, urban areas. And, and, and anyway, so ran into conflicts with people. So it's all about 
um, that relationship. And then the other parts of the story is about um, people that love wolves so much that they want to bring them in their living rooms. So they adopt these uh, uh, dogs that are actually wolf dogs that are 99% wolves because they they have that passion for the wild and they just want to 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 be close to the wild every every second. So so the film is really about well the ethical uh, implications and behavioral implications of uh, of that fascination that we have with uh, with wolves and wildlife in general and and how can we have healthy relationships with those animals without necessarily wanting to domesticate them or or bring nature to our home so so that's what the film explores um, and in terms of how can you see it, so it'll, <laughs> so I'm hoping one day it'll come to Australia in, in, in a festival. And uh, but right now it will be on. Uh, it's going through different festivals in the U.S. and Canada, and uh, and in Europe as well. And it will be on um, on a TV channel called the Knowledge Network. Uh, and I don't know about the streaming, but. Um, hopefully it'll be become available worldwide, but I'll, I'll keep you posted when it does. Yes, so you can see yes. it. <laughs> no, absolutely. Do try and keep us posted because it sounds like a fascinating um, yeah, exploration. It's always one of those very difficult things. I find that it's, it's very, it's very easy to take a sort of an idealistic view on such things, but it doesn't really get you anywhere that, you know, like there has to be a sort of a pragmatic solution to those instances of kind of um, human wildlife conflict and and the different views and the different players you know and, and different kind of dynamics you know that, that occur so it's did you, you um find anyone so something's ringing in the background here that's very weird <laughs> it's not me either um do you need to take that maybe you, it's a call someone sir no no it's, it's not, it's not even my you. phone i don't even know where it is <laughs> oh wow okay. um yeah, very odd yeah my, my wife must have left her phone here or something. No worries. um so anyway apologies to listeners for that um however what kind of out of the festivals it's been at so far you said it was great getting the questions and so on what, what have been some of the more interesting or thought-provoking Kind of questions or observations you've had? Mm. Uh, you know, the fact that people realize that, you know, the films, while it's primarily about wolves and how we interact with wolves, uh, it's it's really a film that uh, people can relate to because they, they have stories about interacting with other wildlife, uh, whether it's uh, bears or uh, foxes or raccoons or cougars. So, I think it has had um, uh, it's resonating with people in the sense that they get them to reflect on their own footprint on the landscape. So if you're um, walking in a in an area and there are wild animals, how how should you be behaving? Should you try and get close and take a picture? Should you try and keep your distance? So uh, yet those encounters become more 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 frequent as again as uh, natural spaces are shrinking and more wildlife are coming to into urban areas where we live so we have to share those spaces increasingly so i think the film got people to think about to reflect about their own behaviors and their own interactions and how that is uh, impacting uh them to um uh to 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 have a healthier relationship with with wildlife so i was really um pleased to see that because it's a these are local stories we're telling with those documentaries but they have somehow more of a universal resonance that someone each person can can take a bit of the lessons learned from these characters and and the struggles what what they're going through in the film and and think about well how how does that impact me or how does that get me to perhaps rethink the way I impact wildlife when, for example, I am, uh, you know, out there in my backyard and uh, I leave food out or, uh, you know, or, or have an, a fruit tree and then the bear comes to my backyard and, and gets habituated. So how do I change my behavior so that we can keep the wild wild? So Anyway, so I was really surprised by by that that uh, the fact that it's uh, it has that universal appeal. Um, and then the other thing that really intrigued me 
is that being a documentary, we don't tell people how to think, what to think. So there's no call to action about you should do this or that. But a lot of people, after they've seen the film, really wanted to say, what can we do? Um, they actually were looking for a call to, to action. Uh, what can we change? Uh, the policy, for example, about not allowing people keeping, you know, 99% uh, wolves at home. Should we change the policy? Can we do something? Or maybe protecting wolves and not having them hunted because in BC it's legal to hunt wolves, uh, for example. So, and and I was um, really inspired by the fact that a film could get people to not just think but also wanting to act. Because to me, well, this is what it is all about. It kind of brought me back to the ten-year-old little girl that I was when I saw the the birds covered in oil. And, and wanting to do something. And I realize that people today in, in a world where we're faced with a climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis, there's a huge uh, appetite uh, for people to wanting to act and make a difference. So, so these are maybe a couple of things that really inspired me uh, in those early conversations with audiences at the screenings. Yeah, that sounds great. So talking about then the actual production of of the documentary have you got any interesting or cool stories or you know that you can tell about when you're actually yeah filming or engaging with yeah particularly the wolves obviously oh yeah i mean tons of stories <laughs> um one of them is is about uh people uh actually rather than the the actual wolves it's it's because these are our stories, like stories that are really character driven. So it's not narrated. It's we're following people in their lives. We follow them uh, over four years and things have happened. There's a lot of drama, tragedies. I don't want to reveal what's happening in the film, obviously, but there's up, ups and downs and things that we, we didn't expect. And um, when it comes to... Um, having people participate in films like that where they expose their lives and they expose themselves to potential criticism or controversy, uh, you have to build a significant amount of trust. I can tell you, James, not everybody wants to speak on camera about having wolf dogs, you know, and living with wolves at home. It's, it's not something that... <laughs> it's a bit of a difficult thing to to do so building trust with with people over over time and our characters has been really something that i've been really proud of because when we started up with that concept of a film it's just a concept then finding uh individuals that are willing to go on this journey and being filmed at home being filmed through what they experience the the good the bad and the ugly it, it is a really, for me, one of the main achievements of, a, of, of the film, a film like that is, is getting into their lives and the intimacies of their lives. Um, in terms of uh, encounters with wolves, yeah, I mean, it's uh, we part of the film was to film wild wolves, coastal wolves. Coastal wolves are a subspecies of, uh, of wolves, and they're they live off. I'm, I'm not sure how familiar you are with it, with these, but they are uh, live from what what the sea brings them. So they feed off salmon and uh, marine mammals, and they patrol the shorelines, uh, looking for 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 what what um, from the the dinner table from the from the sea really. But they're very elusive. They're very difficult to film, and they cover huge amount of territory. So. We set out because we needed this uh, this footage for a film. You know, it's uh, you can. How can you make a, a film about wolves without wolf footage? So we went out on the, on this um, island and uh, and looking for wolves. And uh, every single day, going out every single day. And the first day, we come out, and then there's this encounter with um, a young wolf, like uh, a juvenile. After maybe only an hour, that was our first day, an hour with being there setting up and we're told by our guide, oh, come here, maybe a wolf will appear. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> and then that wolf, single wolf appeared and just walked by us and looked at us. And we said, oh, my God, that is amazing. What an incredible encounter. We were even thinking with my videographer, I mean, filmmaker, cinematographer, this is going to be the opening shot of our film. We we're thinking, oh, wow, that's amazing. And so we're very confident. We were had about a week to film that and 
actually, that was the last encounter we had for another five, six days where we were spending 16, 20 hours out there in the field waiting for the wolves, looking for the wolves, and there were no encounters. So by the end of the week, our morale was really down, and we were, like, carrying our heavy gear going into this territory. I mean, to be honest, if we had had conservation canines to help us <laughs> identify where the wolves were, it would have been so useful, but we didn't have that. So we had to be patient and humble. And finally, on our very last day, Again, we, we found a, a pack of wolves there to, for us to film, but it's really a lesson in how difficult wildlife filmmaking can be, and you never know what, what, what's going to turn up. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it's just being about uh, in the moment and being humble, and, and whatever you get is what you get. So, uh, so anyway, so it's a couple of stories there of uh, filming there in the field and uh, learning about that. Yeah. I think that's really great information for people because we've got quite a lot of, um, you know, young listeners. And I've, I've, I've spoken to a few people who listen to the podcast and they're obviously interested in the work of conservation dogs, but they're generally interested in conservation more broadly. And a lot of them have got a great interest in sort of filmmaking and, and, and that side of things as well. And yeah, in the, in the past, in the distant past now, but I, I spent a certain amount of time working with the people from the um, BBC Natural History um, Unit, you know, who do the kind of the Planet Earth documentaries and all those old Atter Attenborough documentaries. And they would always say to me that it's just it's patience and luck, you know, more than anything else. You know, the, you, the amount of time, you know, you watch one of these awe-inspiring sequences in a documentary and it might have taken them 18 months you know, of sitting on a cold rock to get that one. So it's, uh, it's, it's everyone sees the it's glamour. Exactly. It's <laughs> Everything, everyone sees the, the glamour, but, but it is a lot of hard, hard work. And, you know, you're in the cold, in the hot, in the rain, in all sorts of conditions. And uh, you're there hoping for the best and, uh, and the wildlife doesn't show up and turn up. And so it's a, it's a lesson in uh, being humble, certainly, and uh, and being in the moment in the landscape, and uh, and having a huge feeling of gratitude when it does happen, and you just do have those uh, those encounters. So for this film, we're really on these uh, these two fronts at the same time, where we're building trust with. Uh, with characters, individuals that are slowly opening up to us, allowing us to film them with with this relationship with these animals, and at the same time being in the wild, and and hoping that we can also have these uh, these uh, these encounters as well. So it's uh, it's a bit like to be honest. It's it's not so different from when. Um, People that work with dogs, uh, you know, um, dog handlers, spend time in, in the field with where their where their animals looking for scat. You, it's everybody sees the glamour of are you out there in the field, but it's also long hours and and so much work covering huge terrain. So it's a uh, it's a bit there's a parallel there in, in terms of what it takes to uh, to achieve that goal, really. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a beautiful segue into my next question then. So how did you first learn about conservation detection dogs? Yeah, you would think, what, why, why, how would I get interested in, in dogs after spending so much time with, with wildlife and with wolves? You know, I guess there's a connection between wolves and dogs for sure, as being, you know, dogs are coming from, uh, from wolves. But it, it's actually while I was um, doing a, a short film, on um, on an endangered frog that I first came across detection dogs. So it was uh, in, in British Columbia, not too far from where I live in a, in a wetland area. And we were filming um, uh, the efforts of a biologist uh, who were uh, trying to learn more about what is called now Canada's most endangered amphibian, the Oregon spotted frog. So the Oregon spotted frog is a beautiful frog with golden eyes, magical, beautiful. Um, there's only a few hundreds of these frogs left, very sadly, and they only live in, in British Columbia. So they're endangered. And there's just a few populations and the, the scientists uh, want to certainly learn more about their habitat and where they are. And they're really keen on discovering new populations because, as you know, if you want to protect a, a species, you need to know something about uh, their habitat and where they are so you can uh, 
do what you can to protect this habitat. The only problem for these scientists is the frogs are very shy. <laughs> They don't know that there's scientists out there wanting to to help them. So they're they are in these wetland areas, um, hiding in those tunnels. They're camouflaged very well. So for scientists, biologists to find them, it takes hours and hours during a really short period of time during breeding season in the spring, to go through these landscapes and and find the frogs and. Uh, and it's a, it's a vet landscape that's really hard to navigate. You you go, you sink like knee deep. It's very muddy. So anyway, so I was there filming that, uh, those biologists in their effort to find the frogs. And that particular day I was out there with a cinematographer and we found a dog and we're not told prior about any dog. So I was like, what? There's a dog in there in this whole really sensitive habitat. That's not right. And then I quickly realized that this was not any dog. It had a vest and it was a working dog and there was um, a dog handler with, with, with this dog. And so that dog was, uh, it was an Australian cattle dog and her name was Allie. And Allie was with a group at the time called Conservation Canines, now rogue detection teams. And, um, and the dog handler was Heath Smith, and they had been actually hired together as a team to give a hand to, to these scientists and help find the frogs. And so actually it was completely fascinating to see how Heath was working with Ali as a team to help Ali, and Ali was using her, her nose to find uh, this Oregon spotted frog. We call it precious frog as well. And really quickly, she kind of uh, found a frog. So... It was it was an amazing moment, and I could see the the scientists were really excited at this discovery and the possibility because here and there they're spending thousands of hours <laughs> trying to find those frogs, and this dog shows up and boom, find the frogs like it's it's it really knew what it was doing. So at that point, I I became really curious about these these dogs. So I spoke with Heath about this and the work that he was doing so he really educated me on the on conservation canines and uh, I didn't know those existed I had heard about the dogs in different roles of uh, looking for drugs and search and rescue all these roles that you hear about about dogs finding explosives and things like that but I didn't know that dogs could help with wildlife conservation and for me it was it was a match because you know I was interested in wildlife I'm interested in how people help wildlife and here you have a, a, another animal helping wildlife so from there I really set out to learn how as much as I could and followed uh, rogue detection teams around in a couple of other projects and uh, and that's how it started. So how long ago was that? Because, and we'll come on to the book in a minute, but I've seen some photographs in the book of a very young looking Heath Smith. So, so how long ago are we talking? I know. <laughs> Going to be upset. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was, uh, it was about 10 years ago. Uh, yeah. 10 or 11 years ago. And, and Ali was, um, around eight or nine years old. So she was really a very experienced conservation canine and, uh, and actually tried to, because Ali was the one who inspired me to, to write the book because uh, she was the first one that I met and uh, I followed Ali's adventure in detecting all these species. I, they, I had the, the dream of being reunited with Ali um, in her later years COVID hit, so I couldn't travel. And and finally, uh, this this year, I had plan after we could travel again to to meet up with uh, Heath and Ali. And Ali was just about to um, to celebrate her 18th birthday, um, and uh, and I was all set up to go and photograph Ali and Heath and and the team. And uh, sadly, she she passed away just a couple of weeks before I was able to 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 see her again and it was really sad at the same time you know what a what an incredible story of um how long these dogs can can live because they're they have a a rich life they're really so well looked after by with the with the family they're they're human partners in in this so uh, so anyway i did get to photograph heath <laughs> so 10 years after and uh 
and you know it's um, it's it's incredible to see the the continued passion and meet some of their conservation canines, the working ones, the one that I got to photograph 10 years ago, one of them is Pips, that now is 13 years old. And then to meet one of the other dogs um, that is now retired with uh, Heath and Jennifer at Rogue Detection Team's headquarters, and uh, his name is Chester. And Chester is in November. Now, this month, he's going to be 19 years old. So wow. isn't it incredible? <laughs> Yeah, so it's one of the great things about Australian cattle dogs, actually, is that outside of their their general personality, demeanour, ability, and and so on, is just the fact that you actually get to spend more time with them than a lot of other breeds you know, in their lives. Yeah, you know, which is which is really good. I, I um, think you can correct me, uh, James, but I think the oldest it's a record of uh, oldest uh, living dog is and it was an Australian cattle dog. I think lived up to thirty years, something like that. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's some, something absurd. Yeah, yeah, which um, is is just incredible. But uh, yeah, they they they've got a lot of fortitude. Those dogs. So you so you followed Ali. Let's just stick on Ali for a couple of minutes. You, so you followed Ali around a little bit a while ago. Um, what's your favorite Ali story? Well, uh, you know, the favorite Ali story is that first Ali story because with with a frog, just because, you know, at that time even the idea of um, detecting live amphibians was a bit of a, a wild idea, but 10 years ago, how could it, how could a dog do that? So I think it was, um, she was a pioneer in that sense that it gave uh, uh, people like Heath and others in, in the field um, uh, the ability to reflect on the fact that dogs, as when they're introduced to the different scent, they they pretty much can do anything. It's uh, it's it's really quite quite inspiring. So um, so I think this is this is what what the the story for me sticks because unfortunately I haven't been able to to follow Ali again after that because of COVID. I, I wish I did. But I did follow um, other of, um, others of the dogs that um, Heath has had over the years. One of them is, is Pips, uh, which is another Australian cattle dog. And I followed uh, Pips in, uh, in Haida Gwaii, uh, Gwaii looking for um, uh, scat of uh, ermine species. Very rare, very elusive. So, so I got to see Pips in action. And then 10 years later, got to see Pips again uh, and learn about some of uh, the incredible things that, uh, that he's done. And, and Ali as well, because Ali and Pips together, they've done, um, uh, they really allowed scientists to find the first occurrence in 40 years of uh, uh, the Oregon um, silver spot butterfly. I think this is what it's called, which they hadn't seen uh, the larvae in 40 years in the wild. So the dogs, they make incredible breakthrough, uh, advance, advancing science, advancing our knowledge, and ultimately advancing conservation. So it's, uh, it's fascinating. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so let's move on to the book then. So your book, Conservation Canines, How Dogs Work for the Environment, um, is, is an incredible book. Um, and it's incredible in a, in, in a couple of ways. It's, it's incredible in that it is a great celebratory kind of reason, <laughs> um, product or, or, or thing um, for – I'm trying to – I'm searching for the right, right word, but it's a great – it really highlights some of the incredible work, yeah, you know, that's that's going on around, yeah, you know, all around the world. Um, and so, so, I wanted to talk about the actual kind of just development of that book, yeah, you know, the because because you must have gone around and spent more time with more cool people and cool dogs in more different places of the world than almost anyone. So, uh, <laughs> so, 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 what, so, let's talk about the book. Let's talk about who you spoke to in the book. Let's talk about who inspired you the most. Yeah, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, for sure, James. It's uh, I often I'm really the kind of person I like to work on projects for a long time. Once I I'm I become passionate about something, I think I I just follow the story and I realize that it's it's not uh, something you you can achieve quickly. That I really like to be immersed uh, for a number of years, and maybe that comes from some experiences with some projects with wildlife where 
I found that, oh, um, you know, I want to photograph these species and do a story on this. And then it, you'd get there and then the wildlife uh, doesn't show up or it, it's not turning out as it is supposed to be. So it's really taught me the the value of, of absorbing and being patient and, and, and spending time getting the story right. So I really spent 10 years researching that. And that has, you're right, brought me to <laughs> really uh, um, so many different places in the in the world and now that I finished the book I'm like oh I could write uh, you know the sequel conservation canine too because now I found other projects in Australia in the UK and as I talk to more people I see so many more things I could cover <laughs> so anyway um, I, I really so I started with that first encounter with Ali and then i um, reunited with with Heath um, Smith and went to Haida Gwaii, met with with Pips, and then from there it, it's it was just learning about all those different roles and all the different ways that dogs help wildlife or help with environmental issues. So I really was looking at what are those different ways, um, and it was a way for me to educate people at the same time as they were seeing dogs and what the dogs can do. Uh, really opening people's eyes and children as well on on the variety of uh, of environmental issues. So, um, for example, wildlife trafficking. So, dogs help with wildlife trafficking. So, I heard of a project in um, in Washington where the Washington uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife was trying to go after people that import illegal wildlife products like rhino horn and elephant ivory. So they got their first wildlife dog to help find those illegal wildlife products uh, in ports, in, uh, in containers. It's something that people would never be able to do. And for me, that was a way to show a dog working for this, but also to touch upon, well, what is wildlife trafficking and why it is such a, a problem and impacting populations. So the dogs were really a window into this large issue that, that the world is faced on. And then I realized as well, you know, one of the other um, key critical environmental issues where the world is faced with in terms of biodiversity loss is invasive species, species that we don't want to cause harm. And I know in uh, in Australia, this is quite a bit of a, an enormous problem. I know some of your dogs help with uh, with uh, introduced species like foxes, for example. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, uh, so I I found um, someone told me, hey, have you thought about uh, profiling these detection dogs in Alberta uh, that are detecting uh, zebra mussels? They're an aquatic, um, tiny little um, species that are once they take hold in in those waterways when they don't belong belong, they really uh, destroy the local ecosystems and they destroy infrastructure. And to me, it was fascinating to think about the fact that those here we are, we have these detection dogs that can actually find and smell those little muscles. Isn't it incredible? So, you know, so one thing after another, I really wanted to kind of really look at the whole range of, uh, of those challenges that we have with the environment today and our planet and how dogs can help support and help and be part of the solution. And one of the aspects that I wanted to include in the book is coexistence. I think I told you that I, I've been always interested in uh, coexistence and relationships between people and, and wildlife and fortunately conflict. And so how can dogs help um, people better coexist with, with wildlife? So one angle in the book is around uh, protection, livestock protection dogs and how they help people accept and live with, with predators on the landscape. And another one was um, researching and featuring Karelian bear dogs that are being used uh, in North America now to help reduce conflicts between people and, and bears. So, so it's really the whole spectrum of, uh, of, of those uh, uh, environmental challenges and how dogs help. Don't know if that yeah, answers your questions. <laughs> no, it does. It does because it, 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 it's a great resource for people particularly people starting out and, and obviously a lot of the focus of this of this podcast is is to kind of obviously to celebrate the work that's happening around the world but it's also to educate you know people that are new into the industry and i think um you know looking through your book it, it opens people's eyes because we can all become quite guilty of um just 
concentrating on our line. So, so you're so you're aware of what you're aware of, and so you always think about the use of dogs, maybe in maybe in endangered species, you know, surveys or you know, invasive, you know, use or something like that. But then people don't necessarily correlate guardian dogs to conservation so much in their mind, or you know, or or even you know or even hunting dogs to a certain extent, yeah, into conservation. So it's it's nice to kind of have that broader view because there's a lot of people that would want to work with dogs. There's not, sadly, enough opportunities for the for the number of people. So you sort of have to think outside the box a little bit, you know, to, to make your mark. And so so having those that awareness of those other those other areas, you know, is is really good. Um so I saw that you kind of on that journey, you, you caught up with quite a few of um, of our friends and previous guests on on the podcast, um, and and obviously you spent a lot of time with um, with Heath and Jennifer, you know, and and, and Colette and and the Rogue teams, and um, and Rita, you know, in uh, in Portugal. In Portugal, and, yeah, uh, I did go to Portugal. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so what? What really stood out for you? Is there any? Is there a couple of particular? What I'm looking for is, what differences did you see sort of between the teams? What what really you know kind of took you aback? What 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 was surprising to you as you went through that journey? Mm, yeah, it's a it's a it's a great question. I think there's a there's a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the the stories of um of the individual dogs and the fact that these dogs are very often rescues from from shelters uh and they're really the dogs that nobody wants right nobody wants so they have this high energy they're um obsessed with it with the you know fetch obsessed and uh, and so they don't make good pets and so they end up in those shelters and uh where they have no uh, no options there and uh and here comes along people like Heath or, or Rita as well, who worked in a in a shelter in 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 Lisbon, and this is how she started at a very young age, age fourteen, uh, volunteering for a local uh, dog shelter and working with those animals, and uh, and really for these uh, conservation groups or these dog handlers rather to to see the special qualities of these dogs that nobody really. Sees had seen before and giving them a, a second chance of being uh, being able to express what they are and uh, and do work for conservation and uh, and helping species that are often in the wild are also running out of options so I think it's a it's a story for me that's inspiring the story of uh, of hope and uh, and resilience and that you you should not give up give up on those animals and there's it's uh there's a sense of purpose and i think it can it can really it hold lessons for for everyone i think it's just not just for um, our relationships with animals but maybe on on you know on ourselves and sometimes when we feel like uh, there's no hope and no options it's there's something else we, we can find a purpose so that's one thing um that's been a a theme, a recurring theme in the in in the in my research, and and the second thing I'd say what stood out for me is the is the teamwork, is the connection between the the people and their their dogs in the field, and uh, and I know um, just to speak for a minute about rogue detection teams for for a minute, I they they really emphasize the fact that they're not dog handlers or dog trainers but they're they're more yeah, like they he's a cat person bound yeah he's a cat person so am i <laughs> actually <laughs> we have to talk about that for a minute i know he's always been a cat person and i am i don't have a dog at home i have a cat so i guess it was a good connection between us there <laughs> right from the start <laughs> But I know you mentioned this term about the the bounders um, because they bound to to their animals, they bound to the ecosystem, and and to me, and they spoke often about the dogs being their their teachers, um, and and I think for me it has it's really profound because it's not 
we often interact with animals and with dogs specifically as we tell them what to do. We don't spend enough time listening to, to the dogs, to what the dogs have to teach us. And I think those conservation canines, it's a great opportunity to, to really remember and appreciate what the lessons we can, we can hear from, from what we can learn from the, from the dogs. So, uh, so seeing and being able in my photograph, because, uh, you know, as you know, being a writer and a photographer and working with images, um, one of the reasons I spent 10 years working on this book is that I just didn't do just the writing, but I went to all these places to, to do the photography. And I really aim to convey in my photographs the, the, the connection between people and their, their dogs and, and the incredible bond. So, so that's to me, that's what stands out over and over again in, in every single project is, is, is that connection. Mm. I think that's a great observation. I think I think you raise an interesting point. Um, and I, this is one of the things that that I that I always am, admire most about the rogue teams in particular, is that if you've got a lot of experience, so so I I know a lot of kind of old dogs people, you know, so so, so hunting people, conservation dog people, and they all have that. I mean, that they, they they will all say, you know, if you're sitting around having a drink in the evening, is they'll all say, oh, I've, I've learned more from the dog that the dog's ever learned from me, and they've got that sort of intangible connection, yeah, between themselves and the dog. But they still use the same terminology. So they still talk, talk about training the dog. They still talk about control. You know, they still talk about obedience. You know, because it's just the the common vernacular. And what I love about rogues and 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 a few others in this industry is that they've they understand that words matter and so they've they, they make very conscious efforts to sort of to try and change that to to better describe the way they the way they work because it, it'd be very easy just to use the, the the common vernacular but they really make that effort um from the perspective of a of an officer obviously a word and and visual person yeah you, yourself um how important do you think that is i mean when, when you're writing how 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 much time do you spend on making sure you've got the right word yeah it's, it's i i agree words matter and and i definitely think rogue detection teams has really spent a lot of time using the the right terminology because you're right i mean trainer handler it's all convey those notions of uh, you're in control and over your animal and, and 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 it's not about that so it's it's really crafting words and the right words does does matter as well as um, finding the right photos uh, the images are really and for me it's really a, a process that that go hand in hand you know you can tell a story with words and how are you going to convey those uh, those emotions so this concept with a with a particular image i think it's it's really i spend a a lot of um of time and when it comes with a with a book like this i i'm very thorough like you are very detailed and um, i have really very detailed conversation with uh, with people like eth or um, uh, people that I met in Montana as well around the Carolean bear dogs, all of this will have done really very extensive interviews and several of them. And, and I spent time in the field. Uh, it's not just about, you know, phone interviews. I, I'm very hands-on. I like to immerse myself and just see how they actually do it in, in, in practice. So, um, and that's why maybe it takes so much time to do these projects somehow. But for me to get it right, it's important to to really go into the the details. So, uh, and it's a back and forth as well, where we have conversations, where uh, just a dialogue. I mean, they're like, "What do you mean by that?" You know, I, I tend to be very mm. inquisitive and uh, and push uh, push a bit on <laughs> the boundaries there. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so that makes you a great person to ask the next question, next question too. Is which, which where do you really see the industry kind of going to? Because you've obviously, in in some respects, you've you've been able to take that helicopter view over the over the sector a little bit. Whereas a lot of us who are in the trenches, you know, are very focused in front of what's in front of our or our dogs' noses. So 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 what what have you seen in terms of trends, and where do you think it might head? Uh, you mean for the field of uh, the conservation uh, yeah. with the, using conservation dogs? Yeah, yeah. From what I understand, and again, I'm I'm not uh, you know a professional working. I'm the storyteller, so I document those stories. What it seems to me is that more and more people seem to be getting in this field, 
and um, and and I would be perhaps uh, attentive to do they really have that full of understanding of what what it actually takes to to work with these animals and uh, you know it's like oh yeah sure I'm going to use that method that tool you know this tool but it's actually a a whole philosophy approach to this, which is more just, I'm going to get a dog and go out in the field and find stuff. So, so I think we have to be, I mean, it's, it's, and I think people like Heath and on Australia as well, and a podcast like this is to do a really great job at educating people on the, on, you know, there's a, there's a method here and, and what does it really take and, and how do we do this to make sure that it's not, uh, approach that I think it's oh well yeah let's just go and do this I think there's more to it um, in terms of what it takes to be there in the field the communication the yeah so um, I, I I recognize and value the passion that people have I know oh, I want to work with dogs I want to do this work I want to do something for conservation but it has to be done in in the right way, so so people don't end up questioning the whole value of it, thinking, oh well, the dogs don't work and they don't find anything, or you know, there could be a backlash yeah. there. So I'm I'm sure you're probably very aware of, and that's something you you discuss a lot yourself and yes. with your your peers. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and it's something we discuss a lot on the podcast as well. That it's you know it's a great industry. It's great to have the people interested in it. It's great for the dogs. It's great great for conservation but you can't go and do a short course and then go and hang up a shingle and say i'm a conservation dog you know handler or a team and um and start working because you know the, unfortunately dogs are still kind of under scrutiny i mean a, a lot of the the hiring bodies of teams are still you know are, are, are well aware of dogs capabilities and and are very supportive but you know in in a lot of other cases the, the jury's still out, I guess. And so we have to be very, very careful to make sure that um, that dogs are being presented, you know, with their full capabilities on show, not a dog that may be, you know, not right, com- coupled with a a person that's not right that may result in a in an inferior outcome than, than, than could have been achieved, you know, with a different I- approach or a different team. So, uh, exactly. I, I think it's really important. It's a, uh, it's the right dog. It's the right person. Not every person is suited for this. And uh, no. and this is a question I often get um, when I do these talks. The one number one question: How do I get? It's so great. How do I get into this field? And uh, and really, it's 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 really not about the romance again of being in the field with a dog. It, uh, it's a, it's a highly skilled job and often you know Heath and others have told me you know uh, the dogs learn quickly but it takes a long time to 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 train the people there right to to learn to communicate with the dogs and support the dogs in the field and make a difference oh absolutely and I I always say to people whenever we're training anyone it's you know the the romance is fleeting I mean sometimes you but you burst through into a beautiful landscape or sometimes you just you see something amazing you know with your dog or you know with a find or whatever but most of the time you're spent sweating cold hot steep terrain hurting picking ticks and leeches off unmentionable places that's the reality <laughs> so it's uh there's not an awful lot of glamour there and i guess you've experienced all that in the field you know as well with yeah. the with the photography work and, oh and absolutely uh, uh, and you've yeah. got all that gear to carry around with you you know so, oh the uh, gear and uh yeah, yeah it's it's brutal and people see the the result the images and they're like wow i want to do this too is like, well it's a lot mm. of work <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would love to do what you do, but I'm fully aware I don't have the artistic eye or the patience. So, <laughs> um, so let's just talk about. So, before we finish up, what's next for you? What are you working on next, or working on at the moment? Um, I'm um, explore. I'm currently working on a on a, another book, actually. So, uh, a book on uh, on hummingbirds. <laughs> mm, cool. um, yeah, and um, 
and the reason it's a it's it's a book about um, urban hummingbirds. So it's again again a bit of a relationship between people and and hummingbirds, um, and they're very interesting uh, uh, species. Uh, any, anyway, so I'm working on that. I'm exploring a, a few. Uh, film ideas at the at the moment so uh, because again I feel like it's uh, I want to be in the I want to write I want to take photos and I want to make films so it's always looking at all these different things and how they they interconnect so it's a bit of an ecosystem of <laughs> of, of, of work there um, yeah so um, that's where I am right now <laughs> that's great are we going to see you down in this part of the world at any point you mean coming to yeah well yeah, you know yeah, <laughs> i would love to come to australia i had actually uh, for the book i came to australia once but i, I was going to return to actually include more of a detection uh, dogs and uh, and then covid hit and that uh, ruined these plans but it's really on my mind because the dogs conservation canines they're the part of me, I mean, I may have finished the book, but as I said, it's it's always something I'm interested in and following and looking to photograph more and and do stories about um, in photos and um, and films and and anything I can because it's a it's such an evolving field. There's so much more, so many more stories, and and Australia is definitely a place where I'd love to to come. So I'm hoping in the in the next year. I hope, <laughs> fingers crossed. Yeah. Now that'd be great. Um, so where can people buy the book for a start? So the book for everyone's reference, Conservation Canines, How Dogs Work for the Environment, available on Amazon, all the usual places? Or? Yes, available. On, thank you. Available on Amazon and all the online usual uh, booksellers um, and from my publisher, uh, Orca Books, the Orca Book Publishers, Um you can order directly from from there as well. So uh, yeah, okay. So so, what, so where do you make the where do you make the most? Because I'm I'm super conscious that places like Amazon, you know, you make very little off the uh, the sweat of your own brows a little, <laughs> as it were. So so where where yeah. should people try to order from? You know, I I always encourage people to to order through their independent independent bookstores yep. um uh, I, I don't know how it works exactly in australia but i know in the us and canada and i've done talks with independent bookstores because i think it's really very important to to support uh those uh, uh community bookstores people that have passion for for books and 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 really uh, um promote books that way so i would encourage people to do that to order through their local bookstore or through the the publisher my publisher directly sure. they can they can certainly do that thank you for asking though uh, that's a great message um and how can people follow your work see what you're up to watch little snippets of the uh, of the movie you know all of that kind of stuff how can they yeah of course yes so you? on instagram i i post all updates on uh instagram it's just my name um maybe you'll post that on the on the podcast will, but um, show notes, follow yep. me on it's isabel grok on instagram very easy i'm on facebook as well and uh, and i have a website as well uh that I, I don't update as often as instagram but certainly that instagram is a good way to uh, to to get to follow my work and be updated on uh, on screenings for for the film and uh, talks about the book and uh, all sorts of uh, of things and uh, and uh, encounters of um what i'm working on right now on projects and photos fantastic as well grok thank you very much for joining me today thank you very much james it was such a pleasure to to connect take care